be with you. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to Jerusalem Presbyterian Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Do we have any announcements before we begin? The art fair sign-up sheets are in the back on the clipboards, and there's other stuff underneath. You might want to lift them up and look. There's, we're running out of clipboards, <laughs> but we need everybody's help. Also, uh, as many of you may know, Bree Bernhardt lost her battle with cancer this week, and we're trying to help the family raise some money because their medical bills are sky high. So we had some shirts made up, which the family got the day Bree died, but uh, we have them in back. They're the Team Bree t-shirts, and if you want to purchase one, let me know, and they'll be on our website, team-bree.org, later this week. That's a mighty fine segue into saying that we're also, of course, taking books for the book sale. So bring them in. Tell your friends to bring their books in, too. Please join me in the call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's one body and one spirit, just as we were called to the Lord and hope of our calling. Let us each remember our calling and let us worship God. this day. We confess the times when we have hurt others, hurt you, or hurt ourselves. We confess the times when we have not looked for the goodness in others, but lived with prejudice in our hearts. We confess the times where we have listened to our negativity instead of our better angels. Forgive us. In your mercy, convince, convict, and comfort us and lead us to righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Friends, with our confession comes the forgiveness of our God. We are forgiven this day. As a forgiven people, I offer that which only God provides. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please pass the peace to your neighbor. The New Testament reading is Galatians 3, 23 to 29, and it's in the New Testament in your pew Bible on page 178. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would, could be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. 
There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Jesus Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings, heirs according to the promise. So this is the final week that we're looking at the Psalms. We've been looking at various Psalms for the last month, last well, ever since we've been back in the sanctuary. And we end with a real burn burner for the final one. Now, when you hear it, you're going to say, what does this have to do with anything, especially on a national holiday? We'll get to it at the end of the sermon, just to know it's going to be a long time coming to get us there. So you're going to have to be patient in some of the sermon. But Psalm 137 is really famous uh, because it's one of the psalms that was written while the people were in exile, while the, the, when the Babylonians conquered the Hebrews they, and conquered the Jews, they took a large section of the leadership in Jerusalem to Babylon and forced them to live with them because a way to keep people under your thumb is to keep them close, right? So this is written from the perspective of one of the people who have seen their town destroyed, their nation destroyed, and forced to move to Babylon. So Psalm 137 reads, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept, when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captors asked for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you for what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rocks. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so that scripture is really hard to read. Hard to read in front of a group of people. Uh, it's about trauma and devastation. So, I will tell you before we begin, sometimes a sermon needs to come with a warning. This is one of those times. Later in the sermon, we're going to talk about something really uncomfortable, and I need everyone to prepare themselves. Hopefully this will avoid any weeping, any gnashing of teeth, or any angry outbursts. What might cause such a reaction, we're going to talk about the turmoil in our state right now. We're going to talk about Aaron Rodgers and his relationship with the Green Bay Packers. So prepare yourselves later in the sermon. Just, I, I don't want anyone fainting or, or yelling at that point. You've been warned. Well, let's begin with something else. About a month ago, there was a really interesting article in The Atlantic written by a man named George Parker. And I don't think I agree with everything in the article. I need to say that up front but I thought it was interesting enough to, to bring it to y'all and, and have a conversation about it. Because I do love some pop sociology, and this definitely fits in that camp. And Parker's contention is that 100 years ago, there were two ideals or narratives or visions for what America is. And, and they conveniently were housed in each of the two political parties. So 100 years ago, you know, through the first half of the 1900s, the Republican vision for America's was a land of opportunity, and it was the land of getting ahead, of lifting one's up, selves up by their bootstraps. And the Democratic vision of the time was also one of opportunity, but opportunity in a different way. It was America as the land of everyone getting a fair shake. So this was seen in the sociological and, and economic forces of the day, captains of industry and the self-made man and unions and the New Deal. 
Is America the land of, of getting ahead or the land of getting a fair shake? But Parker writes that the world we live in now is not just two visions of what America is. Again, I don't know if this theory totally holds water, but his theory is that there are now four Americas that we're living in. And so we're going to look today at the four Americas, and then towards the end of the sermon, we're going to see how it ties to our Christian faith and what it has to do with Psalm 137 at all. I know that's a far chasm to get across in the next couple minutes. But the first idea, the, the first America that Parker lays out is the free America. This is Reagan's Republican Party and the politics of George W. Bush. It's the pro-business stance of the Republican Party of the mid-1900s, driven to the extreme, right? Read my lips, no new taxes. Free America looks at government interference, not just with skepticism, but, but with loathing. It wants freedom from bureaucracy, from regulation. And, and the message has been clear over the past 50 years for Free America, whether we're talking about business or the environment or guns or taxes or even the utility grid in Texas, freedom from government interference. Don't tread on me. That's America number one. The second America is what Parker calls smart America. Smart America is cosmopolitan, right? It's sex in the city. It's metropolitan. It's valuing education over everything else. And it could be described as liberal meritocracy. It's the America of Bill and Hillary and of Barack and Michelle. It's America with a passion for equality for opportunities for all. And because if everything's equal, then the smartest will rise up and lead. Now, the pushback to that, of course, is it's seen as elitism. It's Hollywood and liberal elites. And that's not just America, it's, it's this idea of, of globalization too, right? <clears throat> all the world working together, but then the best rise up. Smart America is into capitalism, just kind of more regulation than free America would like. The third America is called Real America. The first unabashed star of Real America in this century was Sarah Palin. And Parker describes her, he's actually really gentle with Sarah Palin. He says she actually was ahead of her time looking back on it now, you know, 15 years ago. Real America is plain spoken and working class and predominantly rural and predominantly white. Popular democracy with an anti-intellectual basis. And, and Parker points out that its roots are deep in America. It's not like this was invented in the last 15 years. It goes back to Andrew Jackson, right, and the stories of his inaugural ball where thousands of people crowded into the White House. <clears throat> and he writes that from its beginning, real America has been religiously fundamentalist, hostile to modern ideals and intellectual authority. It's been isolationist in foreign policy. And when white nationalist supremacy has crept up in our country, it's usually from this part. And we hear the echoes of real America in the slogan, Make America Great Again. Because the non-spoken part is that with real America, there's a real America that we've departed from that we need to return to. And the final America that Parker writes about in his Atlantic article <clears throat> is the one that he says has most recently developed in the last decade. Just America. And it's the one group that, that does not buy what any of the other Americas are selling. The story told by others. That all are created equal, that if you work hard you can accomplish anything, that capitalism is the best economic system. Just America does not think that the civil rights movement solved racism in this country. <clears throat> so Bernie Sanders is a voice in Just America. The Black Lives Matter movement is a voice in Just America. And think about how this group has influenced our local or our, our national conversation in the last 10 years. In just vocabulary alone, systematic racism, toxic masculinity, the Me Too movement, 
And what's the latest phrase in the news? Don't worry, we're not going to talk about it here. Critical race theory. <clears throat> so these are the four Americas that Parker writes about. The four ideas of what our country is to be. Free America, smart America, real America, just America. And Parker comes to the conclusion in his article in The Atlantic that it's much harder to find common ground now than it was 100 years ago. Because if you only have two ideas, those ideas can negotiate with each other. But when you have four ideas, it's much harder because they're all fighting with each other. And we see that, right? The just America folk look at the smart America people and say that the core of the Democratic Party sold out to capitalism. And they need to be more invested in climate change and student debt and things of that. And the free Americans, the old school Republicans, look at the changes of the GOP in the last couple of years and say, where did my party go? <clears throat> and these are the ones that are ideologically on the same side and they can't get along. And so the fighting is everywhere. Case in point, now I know there are a lot of levels to the conflict, but I think some of the four Americas is actually baked into the conversation about Aaron Rodgers. Because he seems to be a product of smart America. Cal grad. Rose to the top. Became the best. Right, Meritocracy at its finest. He started where? He started somewhere else. And then went to Cal. And then became this huge star. And has made millions of dollars. He even got to host Jeopardy. <clears throat> and what's the backlash of many people in the state? He's elitist. He's out of touch. He should be more respectful of the organization that, that made him who he is. Just shut up and play football. I think I've heard that on more than one occasion from people. That's the backlash, right, of the conflict that's actually in our whole country. Now, I don't know what the solution is, especially for Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. I can't believe they want to implode everything because people got their nose out of joint, but whatever. It seems along the way that the communication broke down, right, between the team and the player, or the player and the fans, the communication went out the window at some point. And that's the point. Because what does all this pop sociology have to do with our scripture today, with Psalm 137? Because I told you before, it's really hard to read. It's raw. It's traumatic. And for me, it's really about the final verse. Happy shall they be that take your babies and smash them against the rocks. This is a person that, that doesn't care about themselves anymore. All they want is vengeance. Psalm 137, as you can imagine, can be a lot of things to a lot of people. There are a lot of interpretations, but one interpretation is that it's a very pointed and extreme view of othering. Othering is when you take another group of people who are different than you, and you remove their humanity, and you remove their, your empathy for them. If anybody ever uses those people in a sentence, that's othering. That's removing their humanity. That's removing your own empathy. And that's what we have here in Psalm 137. Those people. The people of Babylon. Now, the person had every right to be mad. They were conquered, they fought a war, they lost, they were moved, you know, it's a, it's a real valid feeling, but we as a nation, we need to back away from the ledge that we're standing at, where we are othering other people in our own country. Because every time somebody says something nasty about Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives, we're, we're allowed to have our own views and we're allowed to disagree with others. I'm sure not everybody in this room agrees with everybody else in this room. But we need to keep it, we need to back away from happening is saying those people. Because if we don't, you wind up in Psalm 137. In trauma, in grief, in anger, in hate. And that's no good for, for anybody. And it's also not Christian. And that's where we bring our own faith back into this, because 
if you didn't catch it, that's what the scripture that, that Pam read the Galatians about. That in Christ there is no male or female, nor, nor no Greek, nor Jew. It's that there's something that connects us more than something that divides us. And we need to focus on that and remember that. Because othering takes us down dark paths that we don't want to have a part of. It's okay to say, I have a different view of America than you may have of America. But mocking and divisive rhetoric, it just takes away the humanity of others. Because our faith is reminded that we are in this together. What connects us is more important than what divides us. And so this Independence Day, let's not look at through party affiliation or politics, but let's look at our most <clears throat> essential attribute, that we are children of God. To God be the glory. Amen. Great Lord, we offer up our whole selves. We offer up our thoughts. We offer up the things that we wish were different. We pray this day for Joanne and Nick and for the whole family. We pray for all those who walked with, with Bree uh, through her illness. We pray for the certainty of the resurrection, but also we pray through our grief for so many affected, for, for a life ended way too, too young. We ask for your compassion to be with the whole family and with us and with all who are grieving. We pray this day also for Marilyn's whole list for all who those who are battling cancer. And we pray for all the families who are walking with their loved ones battling cancer. We pray this day for, for all the people in Florida, for those who do not have loved ones coming home out of the rubble. We pray for that whole community. We lift up our joys today as well, joys of celebrations, of parades, and of times of occasion, times of family, family in town. We pray prayers of gratitude for travel mercies this far, for all those who are out on the roads this week. We pray prayers of gratitude for when families can get together. We pray not just what I and others have spoken out loud. We pray the prayers that are deepest within our hearts. We pray all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother, and Father of us all. Amen. And so we have an opportunity to give an opportunity to, to show our love for God's grace in our lives. And so we give. Let us pray. Great Lord, we are grateful for the gifts you've given us, gifts of time and talent, gifts of times with family and friends, for the beauty of this creation. We give you thanks for all of this and, and ask for our gifts to go out into your glory, to be a part of your love and your power and your justice for others. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
as I look at this beautiful table, I'm always reminded that this is not my table. This is not your table. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is not an American table. It's not a Welsh table, even. It's the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all are welcome here. All who take Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all are welcome here. Let us pray. Great Lord, we are grateful for all you've done in our lives, for the gifts of Scripture to show us the way, the gifts of those who come before us to show us the way, for those who have led us in discipleship. We are especially grateful for the gift of Jesus, who came down and taught and preached and healed and showed us the way to live. We are grateful for his sacrifice on the cross and for the empty tomb that followed. We are grateful that death is not the end, that there is a life beyond. We're grateful that Christ is still there for us to call on and to come to table with. We ask for your spirit to fall afresh upon these elements, upon this bread, upon this juice, that they may become, through your spirit, your body and your blood, that they may become holy and acceptable offerings to you, and, and by us partaking it, that we also are reminded of your grace, and that we become holy and acceptable offerings as well. We pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus who taught disciples of all nations to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not from temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we tell the story that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took a common loaf of bread and having given thanks, he broke it, saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, our Lord took a common cup and said, this is the new covenant shed by my very own blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of you all of it. So this day, as we eat this bread and as we drink this cup, we proclaim and remember our Lord's dying and rising and living until he comes again. To God be the glory, the table is ready. We eat together, for we recognize as the body of Christ, we not only need God's grace, but we so desperately need each other. Friends, Christ's body broken for us. Jesus was very clear. So we do this in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Great Lord, we ask for this time and sacrament to be sealed as we go forward in our lives. And that your grace may go with us with every step and every conversation and every word and every thought. And that we are sealed once again as your people, as your children along with the great cloud of witnesses that surround us in this moment. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go forth as the children of God, for we are called each and every day to live lives of reconciliation and peace with each other. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and all those you love, and all those whom God calls you to love. From now until our Lord comes again in glory. Amen.